Hi everyone, welcome back to the Francis Vogel Story Strategist podcast. This is my show and these are my people and everyone I have on the show is wonderful and every time I have new people on the show I realise that what I'm doing is uh, not only important hopefully for the planet but also for me because it's just incredibly heartwarming having these people willing to give me their time wherever they are in the world. And today um, we have two people who will tell us the story of them as a couple and how they live together as a couple, but also what they do professionally. It's Gavin Bernie Jones and Heather Davies, um, and they both live together in the Alps. And I was introduced to them both by our mutual friend, John Alexander, who wrote the great book, Citizens which I plug quite a lot. And they run an amazing organization um, which is called Reaction. Um, and they also campaign under a hashtag called Citizen Friday. And they also have something else um, called One Tree at a Time. And I'm going to let them talk to you about those things. Um, I also recently did my own carbon literacy training with Heather, which was awesome. Uh, so that's another thing that Heather does. They've got an amazing story as to how they got to where they are. They claim and are the first of something, which they're going to tell you all about, which is cool. Um, and I'm just super happy. And particularly, particularly as I am a um, recovering ski addict, particularly pleased to have them on the show so that if there's anyone else out there who is missing skiing, uh, as a middle class wanker either because they have children they don't have any money or they have less money um, or because they've kind of realised that we're living in a bit of a shit show and skiing is part of the problem then join the club, this is your safe space and Heather and Gavin are going to help us get over it and see how we can move forward with outdoor activities welcome to you both how are you, where are you? Thank you. We're we're at my house um, in the French Alps, just below Maribel. Um, we're not actually a couple. Oh, I've completely we're, misunderstood we're, that. We're a couple of friends. <laughs> but are your children together? So are your children, both your children? So no. So Gav has his children, a wife who live about. Oh, how, in, how embarrassing and how sweet that you guys are so united in a front that it's as if you're married, which it is like that with me and Simon on Best Bud Braver. But um, so, yeah, sorry, everyone. Spoiler alert. They're not married <laughs> or even together <laughs> romantically. OK, thanks for clearing that one up, Heather. So, yeah, no, and I live here uh, with my husband and child as well. So, oh God, I've gone and yeah. put a spanner in the works, haven't I? <laughs> um but you did you did fall for each other as Simon and I did on the business side of things didn't you so how did you get together in that respect then it's a good question we don't actually we neither of us can remember how we actually met mm. but we've both been here well Gav's been here for about 20 years I've been here for about 15 years and our paths crossed through mutual friends I guess I think we probably crossed through my wife Sarah she's definitely more um I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm withdrawn. She's more, more of a pie so. animal, more sociable. So it was probably through Sarah, I think, originally. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, we've known each other now for like 15 years. Both lived out here in the French Alps for a similar length of time. Um, came here, well, I certainly came here to be in the mountains, to go to go skiing. Um, I love just living in the outdoors. Uh, it's been a big part of my life from a very young age. Um, I grew up in the Peak District and an outdoor activity centre. So this place, I came here one year for a, a holiday. My brother was working here um, and came back the following year with him to work and stayed here ever since. Um, have a similar story, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I came, well, I came out here to run a chalet business, started out life in big four accountancy firms in marketing and just spent, spent half my time looking out of the window, wishing I was outside. So, um, and just loving snowboarding, was kind of like how can I how can I get out and and do something that combines love of snowboarding and also love of sort of amateur cooking um with with a job and um we basically found a little chalet company for sale bought it came out and started running it it was just as simple as that really and 
we just loved it out here. We, we actually sold the business after about eight years, had an amazing eight years. It was all going really well. It was more the fact that I was pregnant. I, well, I'd had a baby by then and it just takes a lot of time and energy running a chalet business. And how do you explain to a three-year-old that you're not available for six months of the year? It's just not really fair. So we, um, yeah, we, we decided to stay here and, and, and just change, change our lives again and change our professions again. And I went into, well, back to marketing really. And, um, and my husband went into web design, sustainable web design, and then it's all kind of led us to, well, I suppose, you know, looking, being here for 15 years, we've noticed so many changes in the mountains and the, you know, we can literally see climate change happening from our bedroom windows where we can see glaciers shrinking. We can see the snow rain limit creeping up the mountain. The seasons are a lot shorter than they used to be. It used to be more like 20 weeks and now it's like 16, maybe something like that. Um, and, you know, what and the knock on of all that and the, the continuous building up in resort and you that you just have to question, you know, what's the return on investment going to be when the, the seasons are shrinking in every, every single way imaginable, apart from the amount of beds available. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a funny one, and and also what well you what you came to realize through what you were doing mm -hmm. is um, the amount of waste that was generated from the resorts. Yeah, so when I first got out here, I worked in a chalet company, so I was chef in with my brother for for six seasons, I think, and then um, after that, I opened a ski shop here with a friend, and it was a ski shop that was focused on selling ski boots, so it was a custom boot fitting shop we would make footbeds and insoles to go into ski boots we sold skis um, and I ran that for nearly 10 years um, I think like halfway through that experience or through that process started to think about the impact of that space but actually the you you kind of thought about the impact of it every single year because in December you would receive all of the products and pretty much the first thing you would do is just peel all the plastic off these products, put them all on display and just create this little mini mountain of cardboard and plastic and rubbish. Um, and so, yeah, just start to look at the impact of that space. We did a few things for the shop itself, like we switched to renewable energy. We actually worked with our suppliers to remove about um, 10,000 single use plastic bags a year from the, from the shops. Uh, we ended up opening another shop. Um, and then I kind of got to a point where I was a bit frustrated. I kept speaking to the to the brands and to the reps um, about the industry and about sustainability and if anything was on their radars and like just was but like constantly banging your head against a brick wall like none of them were doing doing anything really. And if your organization or business is effectively buying products off these big brands and reselling them, your influence is actually quite small, um, even if you're, you're trying to have a, a positive impact. And kind of just, I don't know, just kept thinking in my head like this isn't making much change. So we decided to hold a repair day outside the ski shop one year. Um, and that went, that went really, really well. And a few weeks before the repair day, I said to my mates, like, do you want to bring in any ski gear that you've got that you don't use anymore like anything that's just kicking around in your cupboards stuff that's just not used and what we'll do on the day is we'll we'll resell it and then we'll just use all the funds from that day to plant as many trees as possible um and we actually ended up raising like nine grand and got to see the scale of the problem with our own eyes because some of my mates would rock up with like five pairs of ski pants four four jackets and you know they've got two more at home still and you're kind of like what the hell is going on here <laughs> like um i think in the ski industry in this part of the world um we have a lot of professionals like professional ski instructors professional skiers and they just get given a lot of kit by brands and organizations to for free so we do end up with a lot of stuff here um but even like mates that weren't like ski instructors or professional skiers still had wardrobes and wardrobes full of this kit. Um, so we did that. It was a really cool day. And off the back of that, we set up something called One Tree at a Time, which is a French association, which is a bit like a CIC in the UK. Um, and 
a couple of years down the line from setting that up, we opened a community space here in our local village, which delivers repair really and reuse and education and a space for people to come together to talk about climate change. Um, we put on video nights, we do bike servicing workshops, um, yeah, all kinds of stuff, stuff happening in there. And I guess me and Heather just, you would have come to the space a few times. Obviously we were good friends by then. Um, Heather was transitioning from working at a ski school. I yeah, I was head of marketing for one of the, one of, like a, a local group of ski schools at the time. And uh, I started talking to them about sustainability and being like, you know, yeah, this really should be on your radar, you know, given that your business relies on the snow and everything. And they were like, yeah, yeah, it's a really good idea. But um, yeah, they were too busy with their expansion plans, taking over ski schools and all different resorts that, you know, it just they liked the idea of it, but it wasn't, they weren't going to take it seriously and um, and still don't. So um, So I said to them, I don't think I can stay here anymore. I don't really want to continue using my communication skills just for selling ski lessons. I think there's bigger issues at hand. And as cheesy as that kind of sounds, like I wanted to do something with a bit more, well, that I felt had had more purpose. And um, so I, I found a course, it was the Cambridge um, Business Sustainability Management course that I could do online. Because I'd done, I'd, you know, I read a lot and obviously I was really like involved to a certain extent in one tree and what Gav was doing but I really wanted to cement my knowledge uh, more broadly and from a from a business perspective as well so that that course really helped me with that and then I just immersed myself in LinkedIn and I did every webinar going I um you know just anything that I could attend like any sort of events or anything like that I did and um, yeah, I really kind of, I focused quite in on the, on the communication side, obviously, and greenwashing. And then um, Gav had a really interesting conversation with the lady called Catherine Wheatman, didn't you, about, mm. um, on a different podcast. And she, she sort of laid down the gauntlet, didn't she? <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, we had, so I spoke on a podcast about, with Catherine Wheatman, which is called the Circular Economy Podcast, about the space one tree at a time. And like the good thing about one tree at a time is it's completely self-funded. Like it's funded from the waste that's in our community. Like it, it, it looks after itself and it pays its staff, pays all the rent. Like, um, so talking about that and we'd sort of finished the recording and she just spoke, we spoke for another 45 minutes really. And, um, she was like, how do you scale that impact? And at the time I was like, I don't, I don't want to, like I've been, in a job where I've opened two busy ski shops. I don't want that to be my life. I don't want to start opening more and more of these spaces. Um, so she sort of said, well, what about like a network? And I was like, that, that sounds a bit more, bit more interesting for two, two main reasons. I just, like I said, didn't want to open another space, but secondly, I also didn't feel that what we'd created in Bozell at one tree at a time needed replicating or even should be replicated. Like I think, each community should have its own space. Like our, our space is very much shaped by our community. Um, you know, we have an excess of ski gear. We, in a few weeks' times, we'll have an excess of food because all the chalet companies will close and they'll send down all the food to us and we'll, we'll, we'll redistribute it amongst our community. We have, like, loads of children's ski gear that's donated and we've just put a swap rail outside the front of the shop where you just take the ski gear or swap it if you want to. Um, and this stuff is all like kind of relevant to us, but it's not going to be relevant to every outdoor community. Each, each space is slightly different. So we didn't want to just like take one tree and just replicate it. I also like find brands that you find everywhere all over the world, particularly boring, <laughs> not that enjoyable. Um, and I think when you've got a space that's created by the community, it's exciting and there's genuinely interesting stuff that's going on there rather than just a repetition of what somebody else has tried. So we start. I just started talking to Heather, and um, I mean, we had. I don't know what we just had a vague idea. We didn't really know what we were doing at the start, did we? Like we sort of said, well, we sort uh, of had the idea. We called it the collective, yeah, pretty much straight away. Did, yeah. I think, like, we had an idea that it would be a collective of organisations that were doing similar things, and that actually what we wanted to do was create a space where 
everybody could join for free where um they could bring their ideas and it would be it sort of shaped itself hasn't it like we've got it's all sort of circular economy based i would say so it's like we've got repairers we've got resellers we've got community spaces we've got um uh organizations involved in the sharing economy in the peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy uh, so people renting or sharing their stuff with other people but through online platforms um what have we got, got uh, some regenerative stuff like yeah. um organizations that are encouraging people to get active uh, and when they get active trees are planted for them um and that's really cool actually there's a, an organization called earth runs that tash tash runs um and i'm actually part of a one percent club which is just a, a club that she set up where you get a tree planted on your behalf every time you go for a run. Yeah. well every time you do some activity which can be like going for a walk can be like i don't know doing a bit of gardening and what's really nice about that club is none of it is focused on performance like you don't write down like oh, i did this many miles in that time it's just mm. like i did this and the club's really really cool because everyone's supporting each other and it makes people i don't know it feels like a nice community you want to be active yeah. because of the community so here's a real broad range of stuff um and I think what happened... is that an app? Because I feel like I've heard about it from one of my community members. Uh, uh, the club, the club is hosted on an app that hosts lots of clubs. I can't remember the name there, but okay. uh, yeah, because uh, so I've heard of something similar actually in terms of incentivizing people to do exercise in exchange for rather than like shouting about your stats, having mm. a tree planted. I can't actually remember what it's called or what the actual incentive is, but it's something like that, and I love it. And, yeah. and I think it's in that club, it's moved beyond that. The incentivization is just as you're doing it as a community. Like yeah. the tree planting is cool, but like it's actually yeah. really nice to see that there's a community active in the outdoors and, and yeah. people sharing what the, the view they've seen today. And it's just quite yeah, it's just quite motivating, really. Um I think what Heather said just then is really important that when we started out, and even now, we're very fluid in what we are and what we're gonna become. Um and I think that's super important because effectively what we've become now is something that is challenging the system like we've created something that wants to maybe find out what a new system might look like and like we don't need anything to hold us in one place almost uh, to restrict what we do yeah. um and so the whole thing has been from that very first chat from in heaven it has been an exploration into what, what this can become and i mean we've just had another meeting at the start of this week and I left thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to become something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I was like, cool. <laughs> um, it, it has really evolved, yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, it's evolved from... It, it very much started as the sort of circular economy piece, but it we've also really embraced the principles of John Alexander's book, Citizens, and part of what we want to achieve as well is to help people discover their agency. And, and one of the key messages of his book is that you can only just have true agency if you work collectively. And, um, and so obviously we're a collective, so we're encouraging uh, collective, you know, some, most of the organizations in reaction are only like one person or two people big. And um, so they do actually need those connections to be able to achieve more. And what they get from reaction, I guess, is, um, you know, knowledge sharing, but also loads of encouragement and also the fact of being part of something so much bigger than just themselves and feeling that they're doing it. They're not on, they're not doing it on their own. And there's lots of resource sharing amongst the collective as well as knowledge sharing. So there's some brilliant examples of where, um, where, who did um, uh, Rob? Who, who? Where did the jackets come from that went to Robbie? Was that from One Tree? No, no. So, um, who? So we had a bit of a project. There's a, a shop in the Peak District called Outsize, oh, and we've actually that's been really interesting part of the collective because that is it's a friend, good friend from school, but um, that's a family run shop and it's a fantastic shop. But what we've been trying to do is help them transition to being more circular in their space. And that's really cool to take a, a function in business. Like, cause one tree at a time started from a fresh. So in some ways it's easier to introduce that. Um, 
but it's good to work with a function business and see if we can change them. And what we've done there is we've built a reaction drop off um, bin in the shop where you can drop off outdoor gear. And what normally happens when you see one of these bins in a, in a space is that outdoor gear is then just shipped to somewhere else in the world, like taken out of that community. But that gear is actually just cleaned, serviced and goes back on sale in the outside space in the Peak District. Um, which has been really cool. Some of it's like, going to a homeless charity as well. Yeah. So. And then they use 50% of the funds from that rail um, to support Arch, the Arch Project in Sheffield, which is a homeless charity, and Moors for the Future, which is a Moors regeneration project. Um, but it's really exciting to see, like, that is actually displacing product space in that shop. <laughs> like, but they're, they're actively ordering less new product now because that rail's working so well. Mm. The reason I was sort of slightly giggling there is a very sort of sadistic sense of humour that I have, which reflects an image that I just had of uh, the irony of a homeless person wearing a ski suit. <laughs> yeah. That is actually a very functional thing, like yeah. appropriate thing that you would wear in the cold. Um, but what I love about that is from a marketing point of view it really i think serves to drive home the ridiculous farce mm. that is yeah. there's some of us going skiing while there are some people and by only only by juxtaposing a person with a ski outfit could you possibly imagine drumming home that message with such sort <laughs> yeah. of um yeah so crap with such a kind of crass and impactful way so I rather like that that's where that little giggle came from but I think that's absolutely fantastic and what I'm hearing you saying is that there's almost like a kind of on the one hand you don't necessarily see I've got a, a, a very good friend of mine is in the business of social franchising and really has done amazing things uh, across the world in terms of helping organizations um to to kind of yeah replicate their model elsewhere um, but what I think I'm hearing you say is it's not about rep replicating exactly the same model and branding it up as such. It's about kind of working with communities and, and sort of helping them to or rather just giving them the inspiration to do it themselves in whatever way they need. And maybe also providing a reaction bin. So there is a degree of scaling up. There is a degree of it. There's a product that you could you know, at least give away the design of something, you know, that, that in some instances, it would make no sense for your friends in the Peak District to invent their own reaction bin if you've already got a design prototype that you've come up with that other people... And I it guess the question is... Than that, wasn't yeah, it? I mean, it wasn't actually in the bin because they made the bin out of some wood they are knocking around, but actually right. it more the backstory that they needed. Yeah, no, I love it. And I guess it, but part of this, I guess maybe also for Heather as well, is that thing of what would be the power of branding it up as a yeah. reaction bin? What would be the you know, what would be the um, impact of the story there if somebody was to take your prototype, not waste time designing it, build it themselves with local materials, but call it a reaction bin. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? So, uh, and that's, it. that's what they've done, yeah. Yeah, so what, there's something interesting in that because obviously, like, so a lot of the work we do across the collective is involves patching. So what we do in our community space here is we patch over um, logos of ski instructors, old uniform, Mm -hmm. um, and then we resell it now that happens here we've introduced that idea into space in new zealand they're doing that in sheffield as well and each person can or each organization can if they choose or want to put the reaction logo on there yeah. now they put it on however they want to put it on like some might stamp it some might stitch it you know some might be on a fluorescent pink patch one might be on a green patch and like yeah it's like the anti-brand the... guidelines. You're yeah. like, I literally yeah, exactly. don't do what you like. want it to be different. Say <laughs> words <laughs> reaction. Here's how we spell it. But yeah. fucking whatever you want do to do it. Like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I really okay. like that. Yeah. That's cool. We saw so, and at the same time, if you are wanting to cover up something, you might as well put reaction on it. And you know, the the weight of the um feel forgive the pun of weight, but you know, yeah, that the weight of the how the jacket then translates a, a big movement and a statement because somebody has put reaction on it. You know, you, I think you'd be cutting off your nose to spite your face to say, don't do that. Why don't you think of your own local brand? Because what we want is for everybody across the world to be wearing reaction mm -hmm. active wear rather than anything else and proudly running along. I can imagine it now. Um, in fact, where is where do you go on your 
because I was kind of looking for this. I think the first time I met you guys, I immediately got off and was like, right, I must never buy any normal running gear ever again. I've got to only buy reaction wear. So, you know, putting your kind of UX hat on, what what happened? Like, how do you do that? How do I now, know, you know, in Northwest London, how can I go and, or yeah. what was your dreams for how I might be able to buy a reaction pair of um, running trousers she says having put them on but not actually having made it out yet today because that's the best way to incentivize yourself to go at some point in the day isn't it but anyway yeah where do I get those running trousers from instead of a brand that shall remain nameless at, at the moment it is possible so there are some of our um some of the members do have online shops so pre-loved sports would be one of them and they've got a machine that uh prints uh, over prints logos so they can cover up an existing logo with a reaction logo and um and they are selling things online so uh so that's pre -loved sports. again pre-loved sports yeah i think there's a bit more to say about them as well yeah yeah, yeah. there's there's a lot to say about them like they are absolutely amazing i uh, think so i did like... actually find them in the end when i was having a noodle yeah yeah and where are they based uh, uh near hull hull yeah okay yeah um but yeah, they yeah they have an online shop, and Michael sort of set it up in memory of his dad, uh, who died, and he, yeah, I mean he's just one of the most amazing, like generous guys, isn't he? And he's he's just real, you know. He know he loves running. He know he loves being outdoors. He knows the the value of of, of actually doing that from a physical and mental health point of view. And his mission has become to help as many people get outside as possible. And he's doing this by working with community groups. So we, most recently, he's been working with the group called the Primal Runners, who supports refugees. So getting kit to refugees so that they can actually, because they come with nothing. Um, and he ended up, he didn't know this until afterwards, but ended up kitting out to um, football, professional football players who were, who were, they're refugees, but they've come from their country, they've left their country, and they're professional football players. He's kitted them out with football boots so that they can train. They can now train again. And... One of them's played in the Olympics. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and another project that he's supported is with the fire station in Manchester. Uh, so I think this is, is it on Moss side? Yeah. yeah. Where um, the local fire station has opened a boxing club uh, to basically help the the youth in that area um and and to try and uh try and fight against antisocial behavior and obviously redirect uh, their energies into something a bit more positive that's going to make them feel good so they've got this boxing gym but lots of these kids come straight from school in their school uniforms and it's obviously not ideal so um he actually managed to divert a load of kit to them and and they're so grateful and you know just being able to give kit to kids who probably can't you know who are on kind of free school lunches and don't don't have that much of their own stuff it's just been a massive game changer so but he use he sells the kit online to be able to fund uh the donations that he makes to um to those organizations so really important to to support what he does um because it's just having such a broader, like, positive effect. On on that note as well, look, also, I'm personally, I'm not too bothered where you get your second hand kit from. Like, it doesn't have to be someone in the Reaction Collective. Like, it can be mm -hmm. even a neighbour. It can be someone in your community that is swapping some stuff. Like, I don't think, you know, our mission is to try and disrupt the flow of, of new stuff, but that that involves. Absolutely, yeah. Everyone. No, I know what you're saying, but the but the power of the disruption brand, it's a yes and because you don't. I, I, it's really important. I know that people understand that you're not in the business of shit slinging any other, um, mm. you know, upcycled sports brand. But at the same time, the more that um, the more that your brand is out there, the the more widely the lesson is being learned and the news is spreading. And this is the thing, it's, uh, I had this really interesting discussion the other day because um, I was cheerleading a toilet paper brand on the basis that they, unlike the other, well, I wasn't even being, I, what I did was I shared, Heather knows this, a comparison, a comparison marketing table. 
um, just showing how the other perfectly lovely, brilliant B Corp eco toilet paper brands were just falling short slightly because they were still bleaching their toilet roll. And um, my friend Beth, who's, um, I've actually mentioned her on a recent podcast as well. I should probably flag to her that I'm name dropping her all over the place, but she's been in the world of sustainability impact reporting forever. And she first wrote um, a response to my post and then thought the better of it and rubbed it out and left me a very sweet voicemail and wrote me a private note saying, look, I totally understand. Yeah. But, you know, is comparison market the uh, marketing the most effective way of getting people who are not problem aware over the line, i.e. people who are still buying t like three ply luxury quilted bleached, like very soft shall remain nameless toilet paper from wherever, you know, isn't that more important than shit slinging? So forgive the pun. Um, you know, the next eco brand, like who gives a crap, who are obviously amazing, you know, like lots of people will do well to have found them. Um, and that made me have this thing about collaborative marketing budget amongst, you know, uh, you guys and another few organizations doing something similar where, for example, B Corp could match that. And instead the marketing budget goes towards, um, yeah a campaign to get people who are just completely unaware over the line so yeah I'm just saying it's like it's a bit of a minefield but it's people like Heather and I who are trying to <laughs> work out what the best use of budget and time and all the rest of it is to, to change the story right Heather mm -hmm. yeah definitely and it is about changing the story because you know like depending what you read you can see that something like enough items of clothing on the planet to clothe the next six generations of people so, and yet, you know, the brands, the brands have to make a profit. The brands are beholden to shareholders. You know, when, when you, when you buy a new item of, uh, of outdoor clothing or any clothing really, you know, that's, that's another few quid in the pocket of an already wealthy shareholder. Whereas with the reaction model, um, if you buy from one tree, for example, yeah, that's helping to pay a member of staff in your community and that's where it stops that and the money is reinvested in that little community space to be able to put on workshops to help people learn how to repair things how to maintain things um to run film nights where there's you know where people can learn new things where people can express themselves where there is actual community and and i think in an age where we're in a cost of uh, an inequality crisis. We're in a, um, a loneliness epidemic, um, despite the fact that we're more connected than ever. It's not really, it's sort of, it's not real connection, is it, when it's all online? And, and actually what we need to get back to is gatherings of people because that's when we really share and, and that's when we can really help each other. And that's when we really gain that agency. So I think... Yeah, it's about it's a vote for our system and not a vote for yeah. our system, not our system, obviously, but like it's a vote for community and it's a vote for agency and it's a it's a vote for more local economy rather than you know, yeah. making people richer. Mm. And my all piece. I want to say on that, sorry to interrupt you, Gavin, mm. is that I studied globalisation as part of my cultural theory degree 20 years ago and I've been in the business of corporate sponsorship and responsibility for 20 years. Um, and my sort of feeling is, and one of my headlines is, it's not your fault. Like it's no one's fault. Globalization happened. The industrial revolution happened. We're all learning something from it. The farming industry is learning something from it. And actually there's a lot to be said for AI and like digital inclusion and all the rest of it. But to your point, you know, how do we use that? But then still as, as it is the case now, um, uh, it's not going back to local. It's more, now we can embrace citizenship and community and lo localism but with the tools that we have now thanks to globalization thanks to ai thanks to farming technology you know what i mean and it's, so it's, it's rather than going oh my god that was an absolute shit show we all made a massive mistake i'm so ashamed of myself colonialism oh my god it's like all right look here we are what next it's no one's fault let's stop shouting at each other and pointing guns at each other and just go right how can we yeah use what we've got now uh, yeah definitely <laughs> You said what's our like what is our vision and, and i think our vision is to provide spaces in communities that give people the agency to make 
make a decision so like you said oh what what would i do if i need to go and find some running gear like if that was myself asking that question mm. running in the same pair of shorts for 15 years now occasionally need a repair that's what i want yeah like, me feel this year, i need to go to someone and go oh can you repair these or i might want to go to somewhere where they finally wear out and i can find something in my community that i can try on and it fits and i might have to swap it swap them for something else with somebody or um and actually you make a really good point that i have to say the last pair of running things i found was in a shelter shop uh in primrose hill so if you want to buy beautiful clothes for not very much that have only been worn once you go to primrose hill marlebone high street i imagined <laughs> why wouldn't you do that i basically only shop in mary's living and giving and shelter now because i get i i got beautiful clothes because i well some of them are well made that's the thing with these stupidly expensive brands um and you'll find that they're made in italy as opposed to we're going to go down a rabbit hole i've got a couple of things i want to say i did pick out a uh seth godin blog post from today before reading uh before um having you guys on the show and i wanted to read it because it's just very relevant to what you are talking about and particularly what heather was just saying there so i'm going to read it out it's called purchase decisions and when i say today Today is Thursday, the 21st of March, 2024, people. So purchase decisions. All purchases involve a decision. Yes or no, this or that, now or later. But it's helpful to realise that all decisions involve a purchase. When we decide to spend time or take a risk or make a commitment, our brains act in a way very similar to how we choose to make a purchase. When you talk about a not uh, sorry, when you talk about a nonprofit, introduce a new sort of behavior or invite someone to follow along, you're actually selling. Finding the empathy to treat it like a purchase is worth the effort, even if it doesn't cost money, especially then. Um, and the reason why that jumped out at me this morning. Um, was that you know I, I suddenly realized that what you're doing you two is you're selling stuff which is good stuff that you know if and sorry Gavin just made the brilliant point there if I don't probably even need to get any more sportswear you know I'm like where shall I get my react he's, he's like well, do you need any more running stuff really and that's the that's the key question but if you do need some more running and outdoor gear you know you're selling it but what you're also doing is selling, as as we've just discussed, Heather, the concept, the philosophy, the the idea, the 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 kind of way to live. So you you are doing the best. I mean, that's just amazing. Uh, and the people that I want to work with are all in the business of selling both a product and an idea. I would say. So they might be um, somebody who's inherited farmland. Um but who's had to pivot because um, for income, they've got to diversify their income stream or they are really keen to do rewilding. They do want to kind of address their farming history as an organisation. They want to survive and they're very conscious of their impact in their local community and in the wide world. Um, but they probably do need to continue to sell and therefore market produce to employ people to keep their customers loyal and make them feel more involved as well. So yeah, or they're a pub, you know, they're a custodian of a, a beautiful pub that's got an amazing story. You know, it's a 17th century, 18th century, like smugglers pub somewhere on the coast. They're not capitalizing on the story, but they're also selling beer, food and trying to do good in the community. So they're doing the same as you guys. They are selling a product, but also selling a story. So it's a double weight back to the ski jacket you know it's quite weighty for you what do you prioritize and and Heather you said start with and I appreciate your candidness on this it didn't make sense for you because the seasons were shortening so from the cold light of day the kind of profit margin was was shrinking and mm. and I appreciate you saying you know that sort of is what drove us to rethink and this is so much about frankly being able to survive isn't it as much as having this bigger picture vision for how the world should be and people have got to be able to hold both haven't they yeah that's definitely a struggle for a lot of members of the collective is that is that balance of like knowing they're doing something really purposeful but actually you know needing to 
you know, pay the bills and, and that sort of thing as well. So um, what's the overriding driver for us? Uh, I think it would have to go to helping people find their agency, wouldn't it? Do you think? What on a, what's the area I drive on a personal level? No, like for for reaction. Um, it's it's helping. It, it's it's really supporting those people that have stepped into that space of wanting to pioneer these solutions and um and lead these um lead these organisations like they they need more visibility they need a bigger voice and i think that's what reaction tries to give them uh tries to help them find i mean that post you just quoted is is the citizen friday campaign yeah. um in a nutshell and that's a brilliant campaign that heather put together and launched that we ran as an anti black friday campaign in november mm -hmm. yeah november? like october yeah october november time last year um and that was all about, I think that resonated with people so much because we were offering an alternative. We weren't mm. just, there's a lot yeah. of, there's a lot of posts that slam Black Friday mm -hmm. and a lot of people that speak out against the overconsumption and all that kind of thing. But what we did with Citizen Friday was we offered them an alternative. We said, don't shop, share, repair and get out in the fresh air. Mm. And like do those things because that's going to give you so much more fulfillment than an empty online purchase ever could. Um, and we, there's lots of, there's lots of blogs on the, on our website about how, um, you know, how you can go about doing all those things. And, you know, it doesn't have to be difficult. It can be really simple. It doesn't have to be on a Friday. It can be in your own, you know, your mm. own time ever. Um, but the campaigns continued and, and, you know, is, has had quite a lot of interest from people because I think people are like, yeah, this is something I can latch on to. This is something that I can care about and believe in. And yeah, that's bringing me agency. Yeah. I say it's the same because he talks about buying into something almost. And like I, yeah, we've continued to run that campaign every Friday and I've personally really bought heavily into it <laughs> because I just work, don't work on Fridays now both my children are off crash on Fridays so we go and do something in the outdoors go on some sort of adventure every Friday we never go shopping like we don't think about any of that and I buy myself almost that that spare time and that campaign's just sort of given me um I've asked me a quote the other day and they said it's given me like a jolt to realize that the thing that really matters to me is spending that time with the kids it doesn't matter what we're wearing or like if we go skiing what the skis look like or like anything like that it just matters that we're doing something together yeah I, it. you know it's funny because um i'm not god fearing i don't believe in i'm actually an atheist uh, but i was born jewish which is more of an eth sort of ethnic identity um and we have shabbat which is you don't work on a friday <laughs> and saturday well friday night when the sun goes down i've never observed it i'm not kosher either so i've been brought up in a very sort of unreligious family but it's interesting because quite a lot of Jewish young people now are taking Shabbat and particularly in um, reaction to, to digital, just kind of really being able to kind of embrace Shabbat and put your phone down and be with your children, as you say. But I rather like the idea of taking it one step further away from your own sort of self-preservation mm -hmm. and actually, as you say, like sort of blending. It's like a collaboration between Shabbat and Citizen Friday and saying, all right, yeah, definitely do stop that was a good idea back in the day 2000 years ago when they stopped doing it but rather than just stopping we could also you know now do this um you know because I think that's beautiful and and that makes me think okay if I were to go down the Shabbat route uh that would be what I would want to do with it you know I would want to say here's how I celebrate Shabbat I actually you know um doing all the things listed on the citizen like just hashtag citizen Friday and you'll find we purposely not like citizen and as a verb to to each person means a different thing. Like it's it's whatever someone wants to make of it. Like I work for two not for profits, so I do a lot of community work and a lot of um just a lot of stuff throughout the week. And actually Friday, I feel that like that's my time to go and share it with, mm -hmm. with my Yeah, friend. right, right. Exactly. Like, that is your time to be with your friends. <laughs> yeah, like someone yeah. else might think oh that's actually i want to go and do mm. something 
immunity because I don't have the time in the week because of work and that's fine. Or it might be like, you know, like yeah. I want to make some more time to cook some food for my family from scratch or I want to make some more time to read. Or I think I don't think there has to be like... So a... this, yeah, this is the oxygen mask that I think we're talking about, which yeah. is, you know, we're talking about um, all the really boring and cringy stuff that the self-help industry has been talking about for quite a long time now, which is, you know, look after yourself so you can look after other people. But I think what, what this whole conversation is about is, um, and I, I guess this kind of does go into a political conversation. Um, so there's there's the kind of mutual, the mutually beneficial element of um, what we're excited about when we read John Alexander's Citizens book. It's 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 thinking smaller and how how we all have agency and consciousness and can collectively, uh, you know, share knowledge and resources. Um, but it's also we've talked about, you know, being able to earn money and survive and pay the bills whilst doing stuff. And, you know, this, I think, tips into the greenwashing thing, because it might be that we need to pivot from I want to make loads of money, but do good at the same time to I want to do good at the same time, but be able to survive. So it's a slightly like a kind of twist around. It's about having enough, isn't it? And it's about actually recognising that we don't need to have more and more and more all the time and and actually I think if if people ask themselves like how much do I need what do I need yeah and it's uh, beautiful to not in fact the merry quandos and you won't have got Stacey Solomon over there but on the BBC there's a great um <laughs> I don't think I'm saying this now. she she's amazing she's quite but um she's got this great program that is now series four and it's called sort your life out and she's got three she and her three friends go in to these houses and these people have got three children and you know their house has gone into a complete state of hoarding and mess and they go in and they take everything that they've got out of their house and they put it all in a ten thousand foot square foot um warehouse and then they had the family and then the family have to come in and they just stand there in the door and they're just like, what the hell? And they see all this stuff that's been in their house and then they have to at least halve it. And they've got three piles in the warehouse. They've got donate, sell, recycle, not throw away. Um, and the family together with Stacey Solomon and the others have got to put at least 50% of stuff in the piles. And then the rest is taken back into the house, which meanwhile is being upcycled. So they don't buy anything new. This amazing builder in this guy who's the cleaning guy who uses like bicarb rather than um sif and lemons and vinegar and all sorts of fun stuff and has a massive following now because everyone's like what you can use lemon and bicarb and do you know what i mean instead of like to clean your grout um so it's really weird it's like that darning thing your mum's darning watching or listening to the archers 20 years ago and now we're like what's darning but we're having to you know learn this stuff again um and uh, anyway, then they put it all back in a house and the family are like, oh my, it's so amazing. And, you know, Mary Quando and all these people are like, it's so beautiful to have less. And, you know, think how peaceful we might all be. And also we can gamify all this stuff as well. It's really fun. I've got to find a duvet, but it has to be a sustainable, like, so me geeking out, finding the right duvet is quite a fun thing to do if you've got time, right? And the resources, mm. but. Well, that, yeah. that's part of what the System Friday thing is about as well. It's a, like, I've been back to the UK and stayed with friends and what was really obvious to me was how time poor a lot of my peers are in the UK. So these are, you know, I'm in my early forties. Um, most of my friends are in a similar position to me in the sense that they, they're married, they have a, a, a few kids. Um, they both, both parents work, that's key. Um, and that's obviously changed a lot from, you know, uh, 30 years ago, maybe. And, um, and basically, they're so time poor. Uh, so like in the family that I stayed in, uh, the, the mum went to work at 10 to 7 in the morning, the um the dad would see the kids off to school then he would go to work then the mum would finish work at five o'clock go and collect the kids whereas the dad would finish like an hour or an hour and a half later and and it's just a juggle and then it's like kids to clubs you know to so they can do their swimming lessons and their football club I'm literally and all telling my life by the way yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and lots of other people's lives yeah uh, see so this is sort of very middle class family but um 
but at the at the same time that I was there, one of the kids needed a new pair of trainers. And there was no time to go online and yeah. check out Vinted or check out the local Facebook groups to see if anyone had like a, you know, a pair of trainers that they were getting rid of or whatever that would have suit, been fit for purpose. Because, yeah. you know, not forget that kids are growing out of trainers every six months or so. And this is another um, thing, you know, I had I had Will Richardson on, on the show as well recently, thanks to you, Heather. And um, but we talked about clothes, duvets, like what do you and car seats my my husband can't get rid of a couple of car seats that are perfectly good because there's legi- legislation that says you should not have a second hand car seat because it's not safe because you don't know if it's been in a car accident and equally with shoes you know you've been brought up thinking that you shouldn't be wearing other people's shoes because it can affect the shape of your feet and all these kinds of things and duvets are they something that you should get second hand or is that a bit grim <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, well, our family only wears second-hand shoes, so... Definitely got second-hand shoes. Definitely got two second-hand car seats for my children. Yeah, yeah. So... Definitely got second-hand duvets. We got, yeah. So there's well, an education think... around what's okay. But, uh, I think everyone's scared, aren't they, by the health and uh, safety of things. There's so... an education, but there's also, like, the thing about Citizen Friday is about getting people, like, just let, getting people to get that space in their lives where they mm. can where they can start to just breathe a little bit and have the ideas and, and be a bit more creative about how they go about things rather than just diving for Amazon or diving for like the going to the nearest shop that happens to be on the way to the club that they're, you know, do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's about, it's an awakening of, of um, it's an awakening, awakening of that agency. Like basically it's things have been some become so convenient for us uh, you know, to buy online or to or to pop down to a shop or whatever. Yeah, we don't think about when we're not being mindful of the overall effect of the way that we're doing things. Yeah, so we don't even have time to consider that when I buy from Amazon, I'm supporting um, people that aren't paid a living wage. I'm supporting uh, potentially child labour in the country where that product might have come from. Um, I'm also supporting loads of I'm I'm like I'm voting for all the emissions associated with all with all that uh, with that product that's probably come from the Far East. Um, you're supporting all these horrible things, but you don't even have time to consider that because you're yeah. just living moment to moment, and we've got to get there, and we've got to get there, and 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 there's there's no time for anything. So the Citizen Friday thing is a tie is also like a way to give people a bit of time out so they can just actually reflect on some of these things and and think like, you know, do I want to be doing this? Because we're told, and we covered this on the carbon literacy course, that now like 90% of people are actually worried about, about, um, about the way the planet's going and climate change and so on. Um, but only half of them are actually taking any kind of meaningful action. And probably of that half, like the half again that actually is making uh, impact, really and um, truly impactful choices. And I would and go so one we, step further and suggest that it's because people don't know what to do and need to yeah. feel agency that they, for example, pick up guns in the Middle East and do all sorts of terrible things because humans have so much trauma. And then to add that to that, um, the idea that the planet is dying and I don't know what to do about it. I, I, It's not an excuse, but I think that's the reason why war happens, because people are scared. So I think it's our duty um, to help it become cool, to use, you know, to develop these hashtags and sort of to use a, a you know, a brand like Reaction and, and help push the dial in in the best way possible subliminally you know, following on from so much damage done by the the worst thing possible done subliminally by the marketing industry. And so it's an exciting time. Let's let's end off by saying, you know, we're very hopeful, I think. Um, I'm not going to ask you what you two are going to be doing next. It's not going to be getting married, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but also you've been quite clear that you are, you know, constantly iterating, wanting to be nimble, challenge your own system. Um, as opposed to just kind of blindly going on because you've built a great brand or because you've got a shop uh, and you've created a um, reaction bin. Doesn't mean you should like stick with it just because. And I love that. And so I'm not going to ask you what you're doing next because I don't want to force you into 
articulating and then feeling like you've got to <laughs> good good there's nothing worse than accountability for accountability's sake um and sort of feeling like you have to say what you're going to do and then do it because you said you did so i'm not going to be responsible for that um but whatever it is you do do i'm going to let you go because you're busy um you know I, I can certainly say that you're on my you're definitely on my radar and you know i'll do everything i can to hashtag citizen friday wherever possible um and uh well, really just to kind of, yeah, I, I'm just delighted to meet you. I, I, I look forward to hearing more from you and uh, to seeing where you do go next. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Love to chat to you.